Again, we're going to be making our way through Luke 19, verses 28 through 40, but as you already know, before we can do that, we must first back up and discuss what we talked about last week. That way we're keeping everything in its proper context. Now, last week we made our way through Luke 19, verses 11 through 27, and it's in those verses. Now, Jesus is still in Jericho. Matter of fact, the past couple of Sundays, Jesus has been in Jericho. And, and while he's been in Jericho, what has he done? Well, he's healed a blind man. And then there was a chief tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. And he spiritually healed him. Now, there was already a crowd surrounding Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd. But this crowd is growing because of the miracles that Jesus is performing. Now, why is Jesus in Jericho? He's heading to Jerusalem for the last time before he is crucified. Now, after Zacchaeus was spiritually healed, Jesus took some time and he spoke to the crowd of people that were surrounding him. And he spoke in a parable. Now this parable is about a nobleman who is going away to receive his kingdom. But he was going to return. And in this parable, the nobleman calls ten of his servants and he gives each of them ten minutes. And he tells them to engage in business until he returns. Now, now of course, in this parable the nobleman is Jesus and and what Jesus is speaking on is he is going away that being after his death burial and resurrection and where he's going he's going to be at the right hand of his father ruling and reigning until he returns and remember when he returns that will be judgment day now the servants are made up of true believers And false believers. So in this parable, Jesus is telling, the nobleman returns after receiving his kingdom. And he asks to see his servants so that he may find out what they've done with the ten minutes that he has given to each of them. Now the first servant comes up and and he says to the nobleman, Lord, your ten minutes have made ten more minutes. The nobleman tells the servant, well done. Now, again, remember last week we talked about the humility of a true believer. And this servant is a true believer. Why? Because he follows the commands of the nobleman. He invests just as the nobleman told him to. And and upon those investments, what happens? He gets ten minutes in return. And from that... From that, notice the humility in the servant. Because he said, Lord, your ten minutes did this. Your ten minutes did it. And what does the nobleman say after he hears this? Well, he gives the servant ten cities. What a gracious act by way of the nobleman. You you get to oversee ten cities. So then the second servant comes. And what does the second servant do? He said, Lord, your ten minutes made five minutes. Again, uh, another representation of a true believer. And it is here that the Lord, the nobleman tells this servant, you'll oversee five cities. Again, another gracious and merciful act from the nobleman. It's far greater reward than what they deserved. Then, the third servant comes to the nobleman. And he said, here are your ten minutes. I'll put them in a handkerchief. Wait. You you put them in a handkerchief. I, I think we can already tell that this servant is a false believer. Why? He has no love for the nobleman. He doesn't follow his commands. He just put the ten minutes away. But 
But not only does he not follow his commands, the servant even makes an excuse He says that he was afraid of the nobleman because he was a severe man. Now, a severe man? Look at how gracious and merciful he is to the other two servants. He gave one ten cities, the other five cities to oversee. But not only does he, this servant, call the nobleman a severe man, he even accuses the nobleman of being a thief. So what does the nobleman do? He calls this servant wicked. Wicked. And the nobleman told the others to take the wicked servant's ten minutes that he had given to the wicked servant and give it to the other servant. Now the nobleman then says this. In verse 26 he says, I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So the one who follows the commands of the nobleman, that servant or servants, what was given to them will be increased. They will be given more. Church, this is the true believer. When one follows the commands of God out of love and respect, more will be given to them. But the one who doesn't follow the commands of the nobleman will be stripped of what was given to him. And so it is with all false believers who believe that they belong to God. They claim Christ as Lord and Savior. But there's no fruit coming from them. They don't strive to follow the commands of God. And just like the servant who didn't follow the command of the nobleman, on their day of judgment, they will realize that God did not know them. Now there was one more group in this parable. These were the citizens who did not want the nobleman to become king. Now who did they represent? They represented the false teachers during the time of Jesus The Pharisees, the Sadducees. And this is how they will be dealt with in the parable that Jesus was telling. He ended with this, verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Church, there is a time when judgment is coming. And these religious leaders, they were going to be dealt with accordingly. So the parable gives us three types of people. Those who are true believers. Then there's the false believers, and they will be exposed. And finally, the false teachers, the enemies of God. Those are the three And the only three categories when it comes to everyone who has lived, is living, or will be living. Now please understand the only category that brings one into the heavenly kingdom is the first one. That being the true believer. For the other two, the false believers and the haters of God... Eternal torment awaits them. So church, I, I'm, I want you to hear me when I say this. It is one thing to claim that Christ is your Lord and Savior. But it is something completely different to show it. And what does that mean? That means, church, if you are a true disciple of Christ, you are telling others about him. The fruit should be pouring from you. It's one thing to claim it, but if there's no action, that is terrifying. Let's look at verse 28. 
And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So Jesus finishes up the parable and then proceeds to Jerusalem with this crowd following him. Now remember, he's about 15 miles away from Jerusalem, and that would take about six to eight hours to walk. When he is about two miles away, they would come upon this small towns of Bethphage and Bethany. Look at verse 29. Now when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, so Jesus has made this trip numerous times going to the temple. And when he heads to Jerusalem, he would stay in the town of Bethany. And that would be on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. That's the hometown of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We, we know this story, right? Lazarus, the, the one who was dead for four days. Jesus comes into town, says, Lazarus, get up. And what does the dead man do? He, he does exactly what Jesus says. He gets up. So Jesus knows Bethany, and the people of Bethany, you better believe they know Jesus. Every time they saw Lazarus walking, talking, breathing, eating, they're thinking, Jesus. So here he is, more than likely, stopping off in the town of Bethany. And it's here that Jesus, he sent out two of his disciples. Now we aren't certain which two disciples he sends out, but, but we have some understanding, maybe by way of chapter 22 in the, in the book of Luke, it's probably Peter and John. Because in chapter 22 of Luke, he sends those two out to prepare the Passover meal. Now, you can just imagine Peter and John going out, John being the one who can outrun Peter. Remember that in the story of John very well could be Peter talking to John after John makes it to the tomb first and they're having this little conversation. Peter's like, so what, you won this. Nobody's ever going to know about it. And John's like, oh, yes, they will. So we know who's the faster one here. So Peter and John, more than likely, were the ones sent out. And it says in verse 30, saying, go into the village in front of you. So he may very well, they may be in Bethany, and he sends these two out to Bethphage. Now, here's something interesting. We're actually not certain where Bethphage is, is located, but we do know that it was somewhat close to Bethany. He continues, and he says, Where on entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. Now, what are we seeing in this verse? Now, remember, Jesus has been surrounded by a group of people for his, while he's been traveling to Jerusalem. He hasn't been to Bethphage yet. And yet here, what is he saying? There's going to be a colt there tied up. But not only is there going to be a colt tied up there, no one's ever sat on this colt before. How would he know that? Well, he's Jesus. He's, he's omniscient. That means he knows everything. So what else is being said by him stating this? What is it that we know, church? We know that God knows all things. And yet, what are we seeing here with Jesus? His omniscience. For he too knows all things, which says what? That Jesus is God. You see the deity in Jesus here. Now, why, why is it so important that the cult has not been sat on? It tells us that the cult is pure and has been set aside for a special purpose. Now, look at verse 31. Jesus telling his disciples how to handle this situation while they go in and what appears to be them stealing a colt. They're not, but it could look like that. So look at verse 31. He says, If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So not only is Jesus 
telling his two disciples that there's going to be a colt, but he's even telling them, you're going to be questioned while you're untying this colt. So he says, when you're questioned, all you have to say is the Lord has need of it. So if he is in the small town of of Bethphage, the disciples have been with Jesus for three years now, correct? We we understand that, we know that. They've, They've been with him throughout his miracles. So the town of Bethphage, again, remembering what Jesus did with Lazarus, would probably also remember the disciples that travel with Jesus. So here, when they say the Lord needs this cult, of course, the owner would put two and two together and say, okay, I understand who your Lord is. I, I, I get that. It's, it's Jesus. We, we know the miracles that, we, that he has done. We, we've heard him preach before. This authority that no one has ever preached with. So take the colt. Now, Bethphage would have also, the village would have heard about the blind man being healed. So all these things are coming together. Now, look at verse 32. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. I mean, you can, you can picture these two walking into the town. They're looking around, and sure enough, there's this colt. Just as Jesus said there would be. Now, to us, that may not be that big of a deal because we've heard this story so many times. But, but can you imagine just being these disciples just amazed time and time again from this man that you follow this God man that you follow and yet here again that moment that glorious moment of that cult just sitting there in verse 33 and as they were untying the cult its owner said to them why are you untying the cult again Peter and John would have to look at each other it's like it's Jesus he's batting a thousand Everything he says happens just as he says it will. And what do they do? Well, you better believe they're going to follow his commands. Verse 34 tells us, and they said, the Lord has need of it. No questions were asked. So you may be asking, right? Why the cult? I mean, You think about Jesus, Messiah, Savior, the Anointed One. Why not a beautiful white stallion? Church, we understand that there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to Christ. Please understand that Jesus fulfilled Every single one of those. So why the cult? 500 years before this took place, the prophet and priest Zechariah said this. Zechariah 9.9 Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt. Five hundred years, church, and here Jesus is fulfilling the prophetic words of Zechariah, and the book of Matthew verifies this. Look at Matthew twenty-one four through five. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So now, the two disciples have the colt.
every time I read that, I probably shouldn't say this, but every time I read that verse, I, I just have the Rolling Stones song playing in my head. I'm sorry. So they have the colt. Okay? They have the colt in verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. So what are they doing? They're making a makeshift saddle for the Savior. Man. The king doesn't even have a saddle? He's using cloaks. Do, Do we see the humility of the Lord? No saddle riding a baby donkey. We see this humble servant who is soon to become the suffering servant. Again, Jesus didn't ride into Jerusalem on a massive stallion ready for war. No, instead he rode just as the prophets predicted. He was coming as the Savior. Church, this isn't what Jerusalem expected. They were waiting for that warrior king. Or they were waiting for that God-man who would do some type of miracle and bring Rome to its knees. But this man, riding on a makeshift saddle, on a colt, That's not what they expected. Look at verse 36. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Now, why were they doing this? The act of spreading their cloaks before him symbolized their submission to him, the king. And we see this in 2 Kings 9.13. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on their bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, She who is king. Jehu is king. So this was something that was done. This was a tradition. People understood what was taking place. We're going to throw the cloaks before Jesus, have his colt walk on top of them. Because here we are saying that, yes, we are submitting to you. But they are submitting to him for the wrong reason, church. This wasn't for their salvation. They didn't believe that. They thought they were going to be rescued from the the oppression that they were under from the Roman Empire. They weren't worried about their sins. The King of Kings was before them, their Savior riding on a donkey. And it's making its way through their pile of coats. Now, the disciples didn't fully understand what was going on. And the word tells us that they would not understand until after they witnessed the glorification of Jesus. See, it would be then that the Holy Spirit would reveal the truth to them from the Scripture that spoke of this very moment. Now, look at verse 37. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. So it's here, as he's descending, the city of Jerusalem is now in sight. And the crowd begins to erupt, not only the people who were following him, But now Jerusalem sees him coming. And they were now pouring out of Jerusalem as they see Jesus approaching on the colt. There would just be this onslaught of colts being tossed on the ground now. But not just colts. People would be cutting palm branches, throwing them on the road as well. So you've got colts and palm branches 
And what do the palm branches symbolize? Joy, celebration, a victory. The king is here. And yet, church, they're rejoicing. They're shouting with praise. But it's so sad. Because the very ones who are shouting, Jesus, the king is here, will be the same one shouting just a few days later, crucify him. So the celebration is getting louder. The voices, the praise is getting stronger. Because the crowd is getting thicker. And then we see verse 38 saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now this song, song, this saying comes from the Psalms 118.26. Where it said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Isn't that something, church? The Jewish people know the word. They know the verses that recognize the coming Messiah. But sadly, they do not understand it. They didn't see Jesus as the Savior, the one who would rescue them from their sin. Again, they saw him as an earthly king who would free them from their oppression. And it's evident in the next verse when the massive crowd shouts this out, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Again, they're expecting Rome to fall and Jerusalem to rule. They believe that's the only way they could, there could be peace in heaven was for Jerusalem to be freed and ruling glory brought to Jerusalem. By way of the Messiah. But that's not what the word says, church. That's what their false tradition says. It's what their false tradition taught. And church, sadly, because they didn't look into the word themselves, that's what they believed. The word in Zechariah 12.10 says this, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. See, the very word that they had doesn't describe a warrior king. It describes a suffering servant. And they missed it. Church, time and time again, we we get up here and we talk about what? Using your discernment. It doesn't matter who is standing before you teaching. You compare what they say to the Word of God. Because the Jewish people had missed it. And I can prove it. Look at Isaiah 53, verses 6 through 11. I'm just letting you know we're in Isaiah right now on Wednesday nights. We'll be getting to verse 53 in about six and a half years. (laughs) Isaiah 53, verses 6 through 11. Listen, listen, this just points you to The cross, church. Again, this is coming from the Old Testament. Letting the people know who the Savior is going to be and what is going to take place. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. I would encourage every single one of you all to just read all of Isaiah 53. Just take it in. And and you see how it points to Christ. The Messiah that the people, the Jewish people, had been waiting for. And yet they missed it. The Jewish people had heard these verses time and time again. But sadly, sadly they bought into the false teaching of the religious leaders. Did not see the truth in the word of God about what the Messiah was sent to accomplish. So the coats were scattered on the ground along with palm branches And the crowd was worshiping loudly. Look at verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. See, the the false teachers of this time, these religious leaders that had led the people astray, they see this as being blasphemous. The crowd was recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. And of course, this fueled their hatred towards him. See, the Pharisees also understood something else, that they had no control over this crowd. There was nothing they could do. For the joy of the crowd was too great for the Pharisees to extinguish The church, Jesus was not joyous. He was full of sorrow that day. He was the man of sorrow because he knew that they weren't there truly worshiping him as the Savior. They were worshiping him falsely as the warrior king. And this wasn't the time for the warrior king. That time would take place on his second return in all his glory. Again, when he brings judgment upon the world. So here the crowd is rejoicing while Jesus rides in sorrow. For he knows that this crowd that was cheering for him on this Monday event will be yelling, crucify him soon. Now he looks to the Pharisees as they're yelling out. And and this very well could be another illustration uh, showing us the deity of Jesus, if you think about it, because it would be so loud. And yet Jesus hears the Pharisees. He hears them. Where it very well could be they fought their way through the crowd and got right up on him. But he looks to them and he answers them in verse 40. He says, I tell you, 
If these were silent, meaning the people, the very stones would cry out. Now Jesus answers the Pharisees, but to be honest with you, in a manner that many of us still find a bit confusing. This is just speculation here. Did he mean that even if these some of the true believers were there and the false believers that were there that were cheering for him, even if they were silent, is he making the claim that even the stones surrounding him on the ground would cry out to him because they recognized their creator? They recognized the true Messiah. Or is he referring to the stones that would come crashing down? The very stones that made up the temple in 70 AD. And why did that temple come crashing down? Because the Jews failed to recognize the King of Kings. We can only speculate. But what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees is that he is the king of kings. And the Messiah will always be recognized even if the Jews don't recognize him. Church, it's terrifying in the world that we live in today. To be honest with you, I think we're past the post-modern world. And I think it was John MacArthur who said, we're just living in a pagan land now. Church, the one thing that we need to be doing, that Jesus himself called us to do, is to go out and make disciples. Do you know what that means? That means you're going to have to tell people about Jesus. It should be a burden that's been laid upon you. And what a perfect time to do it because we now live in this pagan land that has just blown past the postmodern realm. Church, if you are a true believer, you should have a weight bearing down on you. Not to just come and worship but when you're out in the world to tell others the good news. See, that's the difference between a true believer and one who is false. For a true believer, the fruit pours from them by way of their actions. They can't keep their mouths shut telling others about the Savior. For the false believer will show up on church Sundays and Wednesday nights and then keep their mouth shut throughout the week. It's time for us to step up. It's time for you to evaluate yourself. Which category do you fit in? The category that you can't keep your mouth shut about the good news? Or are you in the category of just plain pretend? Because he is coming back. And when he returns, will he say to you, good job, my faithful servant? Or will you see the warrior king riding in on that white horse covered in blood? It's the only two options, church. So I pray that when we leave here, we go out into this pagan land that we're in right now. I mean, if you want to make a change, you have to tell the others the good news. That's the only way it's going to get better. The word has to spread. So I pray 
that when you leave, throughout this week, you're sitting down with people, maybe strangers, maybe people you work with, friends, enemies, doesn't matter. And you look at them and you ask them, do you know what Christ did for the wicked? Do you know who the wicked are? The wicked are the very ones who don't believe in Christ as their Lord and Savior. But do you know what he did for you? If you believe, don't start out with Jesus loves you because we don't know. But if you believe in Christ, let me tell you what he did 2,000 years ago. He went to the cross And while he was sitting there suffering and dying, God's wrath was being poured out on him. The very wrath that you deserve, O wicked one. If you believe in Christ and what he did, your sin debt has been paid in full. You'll be able to stand before the Lord and he will see you as righteous. Not because you are righteous, but because he was. You have been clothed in his righteousness But if you reject this good news, do you know what waits for you, O sinner, O wicked one? Eternal torment. This is what we should be doing, church. Telling the people in this pagan land the wonderful news. Let us pray.